It's about time we begin our evening service. We're glad that everyone's here. We want to welcome all of uh, everyone that's here, especially if you're visiting with us. We're glad that you're here and part of our service tonight. Uh, one thing I've been reminded of, there's no Bible hour tonight. So uh, we will not be sending the little ones out to Bible hour tonight. Uh, this week, all week long, Monday through Thursday, the Fred Hardeman Lectureship, uh, the activities in Lloyd Auditorium will be shown here in the auditorium. Uh, you can come anytime. There's a schedule in the foyer and uh, watch as much as, or as little as you want to. And it will stay on till probably around 8.30 uh, each evening this week. So if you'd like to be part of the Fred Hardeman uh, Lectureship, uh, you can come and, and watch it as long as you would like to this week. At this time, we're going to enter into our service together. Let's start with a prayer. Father, thank you for the opportunity to be here tonight, to come together to sing songs of praise and to worship you. We pray that our worship tonight will be acceptable in your sight, and we pray that you'll be with us as we leave tonight, that we can take the love of Jesus from this building and carry it throughout our community. These things we ask through Jesus' name. Amen. Oh! 
Let's pray together. Lord, we want to thank you for this beautiful Sunday you've allowed us to have and us being able to come here and gather together. And Lord, we want to thank you for everybody getting here safely, Lord. Father, we know we're so greatly blessed in this world that we live in. You know, you give us food and water and clothes and everything that we need, Father. We thank you so much for it. Lord, we want to thank you for us being able to sing to you tonight. We hope that our worship was good and beautiful for you, Lord. We thank you for Mike and allowing us him to be able to come up and lead us. Lord, we thank you for your word. We, hope, we pray that Greg will be able to come up and deliver it to us well so that we can have it in our hearts and we can use it to mold ourselves to be more like you, Lord. Lord, we thank you so much for the Passover and what it was and what it meant to the Jews and what it means to us today and Jesus Christ and his role in that, Lord. And it's in his powerful name that we pray to you tonight. Amen. Scripture reading will be Exodus 12, 12, and 13. Exodus 12, 12, and 13. For I will pass through the land of Egypt on that night and will strike all the firstborn in the land of Egypt, both man and beast, and against all the gods of Egypt. I will execute judgment. I am the Lord. Now the blood shall be a sign for you on the house where you are. And when I see the blood, I will pass over you, and the plague shall not be on you to destroy you when I strike the land of Egypt. Good evening, and thank you so much for being a part of our service tonight. I join Tommy in welcoming you here. Uh, we especially welcome you if you're visiting with us, and I want you to consider this your invitation to come to worship with us again every opportunity that you have. Have you ever asked the question, why do we do what we do? Little Nancy asked her question, asked her mom that question one evening. She asked her mom as she was preparing lunch why it was that she cooked her ham after she cut the ends off of the ham. Her mother said, well, I'm not really sure. I suppose it has something to do with the juices and the spices. Cutting the ends off allows the juices and the spices to make it more tender and, and make it more tasty. But I really don't know. I learned it from your grandmother. Why don't you call and ask her? So little Nancy called up grandma and asked her the same question. Her grandma said, well, you know, Nancy, I've never really even thought about it. I don't remember, but I guess your mother is right. I guess it's so the ham can better absorb the juices and spices and make it more tender. But I learned that from your great-grandma. Why don't you call and ask her? Well, by this time, Nancy was getting a little bit frustrated about getting the runaround with this ham. But she called her great-grandmother and she asked her the same question. Great-grandmother thought about it for a minute and then she began to laugh. And she said, well, Nancy, she said, I don't know much about the juices and the spices. And I don't know if, if cutting the ends off makes it more tender. She said, I always cut the ends off of my ham because it won't fit in my pan. Sometimes we forget why it is that we do things. We forget why it is that we do what we do. Each Sunday morning we gather around this table and we partake in the Lord's Supper. We remember what Jesus did for us in coming to this earth, living the life that he lived and dying on that cross and being resurrected. But what we want to do tonight is look at the background of that from Exodus chapter 12. Something that I think we forget from time to time, I know I do, is that when Jesus was saying what he said to people and when the Jews in particular were listening to what he was saying, they were hearing and reading things through the Old Testament, through a knowledge of the Old Testament. They, they had that background. There are, there are things that are alluded to in the Old Testament and a lot of stories that, to be quite honest, we miss we, because we don't, we don't have that knowledge that they had from the Old Testament. But this one is a little more obvious than others. As Jesus instituted the Lord's Supper there as a part of that Passover feast. So tonight I want us to look at Exodus chapter 12 and, and consider, consider what happened there kind of relate that in an, an analogous 
analogy, analogy, I'll get it out in a minute, to the Lord's Supper today and then ask the question, what does that mean? And the lesson will be yours. I invite you to turn your, your Bible over to Exodus chapter 12. I am not going to read all of this chapter. Uh, it's not one of those things that is just uh, uh, easy to read or, or I don't know, you might even say it's not that interesting to read, but there's a lot of good stuff there. If you've got your outline in front of you, I'm pretty sure I put the verse references on each of these points so you can kind of follow along. And we will read some of these verses from time to time. We're just not going to read the text in its entirety. To set this in context, God has already sent the nine plagues on the Egyptians. He is preparing to remove his people from slavery. And he is preparing to send that tenth plague, the death of the firstborn. The Israelites would be able to avoid this plague if they do what they are instructed. And so God gives Moses and gives the people here these instructions. And he says, first of all, here are just some of the things with the Passover. In verse number 3, a lamb was to be sacrificed. Tell all the congregation of Israel that on the tenth day of this month, every man shall take a lamb according to their father's house, a lamb for a household. Verse 4, this lamb was to be shared with others. You see, this event was to be a communal event. Verse 3 talks about it being uh, a lamb for a household. If you go down to verse 6, it talks about the whole assembly of the congregation of Israel shall kill their lambs at twilight. And so in the one sense, it was an individual type uh, commandment, something they were supposed to do. But there was also this communal element in that it was shared with others others. Verse 5 says that the lamb was to be without defect. Verse 46 says that there were to be no broken bones. You see, the lamb that was given, that was to be slaughtered, was to be without blemish, a male, a year old. It was to be something special, not the leftovers, something unique. Verse 7 says that the blood's important. They shall take some of the blood and put it on the two doorposts and the lintel of the houses in which they eat it. The blood is important. Symbolizes a sacrifice. It symbolizes this sacrifice offered as a substitute. And as we said, this particular blood was to be applied on the doorpost. It's not that it was just to be shed, but it was to be applied on the doorpost. It, they had to do something. Now, in the, the previous nine plagues, there wasn't a lot for them to do. But here God says, if you do not want to suffer the same consequences, the same plague as the Egyptians, then you have to do something about it. You kill this lamb, you take this blood, and you put it on the doorposts. Verse 8 says that there were certain elements to be eaten. They shall eat the flesh that night, roast it on the fire, with unleavened bread and bitter herbs, they shall eat it. The lamb was to be eaten. The bitter herbs were uh, indigenous to Egypt. Some have said this was a reminder of the bitter years of slavery. The bread was to be made without yeast to show haste with which they would leave. As they are getting ready to depart to leave Egyptian slavery. Verse 11 says that they were to eat it with a certain mindset. In this manner you shall eat it with your belt fastened, your sandals on your feet, your staff in your hand, and you shall eat it in haste. It is the Lord's Passover. Cloak was to be tucked, sandals on feet, staff in hand. All this to show the haste with which we are to leave. They are ready and willing to get out of slavery. And then verses 12 and 13, there will be a Passover of death. Death will pass over you. I will pass through the land of Egypt that night, and I will strike all the firstborn in the land of Egypt, both man and beast. And on all the gods of Egypt, I will execute judgments. I am the Lord. Verse 13, the blood shall be a sign for you on the houses where you are. And when I see the blood, I will pass over you. You, thus the name of the feast, Passover. I will pass over you, and no plague will befall you to destroy you when I strike the land of Egypt. The blood would be a sign. The Egyptians would suffer. 
the Israelites would not. In every Egyptian home, there was a dead firstborn child or animal. But in every Jewish home, there was a dead lamb. God would bring judgment on the gods of Egypt. God would show his force in a mighty way, in a great way, in punishing Egypt. But the Israelites would be spared. Verse 14, they are told this is to be a day that you are to remember. It's to be for you a memorial. You shall keep it as a feast of the Lord throughout your generations, as a statute forever. You shall keep it as a feast. If you go over several verses down to verse 27, you shall say, this is when your children say to you, what do you mean by this service? In other words, as you're, as you're remembering this, as you're uh, taking part in this memorial, and your children say, why are we doing this? Why do we do what we do? You say, it is the sacrifice of the Lord's Passover, for he passed over the houses of the people of Israel and Egypt when he struck the Egyptians but spared their houses, and the people bowed their heads in worship. It was a day to be remembered. Also in these same verses, it was a day to be celebrated. It was a day that they would remember throughout. It was a day that they would look back on and, and remember when God freed them from this slavery. If you go through the text now, you have uh, the, 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 the plague continuing. You have uh, the tenth plague, the death of the firstborn, and then you have the exodus. If you, if you go on past that and go down to verses 43 through 51, as the Passover is kind of officially instituted, you'll find that there are some restrictions. In other words, God says only those that are circumcised will take part in this. This isn't just for everyone. No one could participate who was not circumcised. And I, I know there's a lot more details and a lot more things we could say about that, but you get the general idea, you get the general picture of what's going on here with the Passover. When the Israelites were given specific instructions and a time was set aside when they would always remember the blessing of the Passover, when they would remember what it was that God did for them, when they would remember how they followed His instructions, how they put the, door on, the blood on the doorpost, and how they were passed over when death came. What a, what a great, great testimony to what God did. The way that he was able to uh, free them from this slavery. Fast forward several hundred years. Go several pages over in your Bible to Luke chapter 22. And I, Luke's account is, is, is one account. It's in the other Gospels as well. But in Luke chapter 22, we have Jesus eating this Passover meal with his disciples. They were good Jews. It was that time of year. And so they are making preparation for that. Verse 7 says, Then came the day of unleavened bread, on which the Passover lamb had to be sacrificed. And so Jesus sends them and tells them to go make preparation for that. So in the context of what we have just read, in Exodus 12, as we think about what these disciples would be thinking about in this feast, as they would go through and remember what all God has done for them, Jesus gives them something else to remember. Jesus supersedes that in a way. Jesus says, in addition to remembering what God did for you in bringing you out of physical slavery, now I am going to give you something. I am going to sacrifice something to remind you of what God did in bringing you out of spiritual slavery. And so in the context of that, Jesus institutes for us the Lord's Supper and tells them about His body. And his blood tells them about the new covenant, tells them about the sacrifice and reminds them to remember the good gift. So as we go through and think about this, let's let's go back through some of these things that we said about the Passover and apply them to the Lord's Supper. You see, with the Lord's Supper, as with the Passover, a lamb has been sacrificed. A lamb has been sacrificed. Jesus, Jesus is our lamb, that perfect lamb, that lamb without spot or blemish was sacrificed. John 1, 29, John the Baptist sees Jesus coming toward him and he says, Look, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. In 1 Corinthians 5, 7, Paul says, Get rid of the old yeast that you may be a new batch without yeast as you really are. For Christ, the Passover Lamb, 
has been sacrificed. And in John 6, Jesus himself says he is that true bread. The sacrifice that was necessary for them to escape physical death, the sacrifice has now been made for us to escape spiritual death. The lamb is to be shared with others. 1 Corinthians 11, Paul reminds the Corinthians there that it's about community, and they had forgotten that. The rich were taking advantage of the poor, and there was no unity there. The rich were, were getting full and, and having plenty to drink before the poor folks even showed up. And Paul reminds them that that's not what the Lord's Supper is about. It instead is about community. It's about unity. It's, not, it's, it's showing the unity that we have, not the differences. The lamb is to be shared with others. The lamb sacrificed was without defect. Jesus was perfect. 1 Peter 1, 18 and 19, Peter says, For you know that it was not with perishable things, such as silver or gold, that you were redeemed from the empty way of life handed down to you from your forefathers, but with the precious blood of Christ, a lamb without blemish or defect. 2 Corinthians 5, 21, Paul says, God made him who had no sin to be sin for us, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. No broken bones, John 19. Spotless, without blemish. As with the uh, Passover, so with the Lord's Supper, the blood is important. Hebrews 9, 22, in fact, the law requires that nearly everything be cleansed with blood, and without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness. Stories told of a little girl who was was singing about what God did for our sins. And she meant to say, He blotted our sins out. But instead, she said, He bloodied them out. Which is probably just as accurate. The blood has to be applied. You see, as, as the Israelites had to put, door on, or put blood on the doorpost, so we have to do something. There's no saying that says the gospel is kind of like soap. To do any good, it's got to be applied. We apply the blood of Jesus, or it is applied at baptism. When we reenact that death, burial, and resurrection of Christ, we reapply that blood at the Lord's Supper when we think about the sacrifice that He made for us, and we remember and celebrate that particular sacrifice. There are certain elements to be eaten. We eat the bread as representation of His body, and we drink the fruit of the vine as representation of His blood. We too eat it with and drink it with a certain mindset, ready and willing to leave spiritual slavery. You see, as we gather around the table and we partake of this bread and we partake of this fruit of the vine, I hope that we will remember what Paul said about us being slaves to sin, yet no more. I hope that we remember the lamb that was sacrificed and the fact that without that sacrifice, we would still be slaves to sin. But because of it, we can be free. Jesus tells us in Luke 22 that we, are to re, that we are to remember this day and also that we're to celebrate this day. There is a Passover of death. The Lord's Supper reminds us that we do not have to face spiritual death. It reminds us that because of our faithfulness, our obedience, because of the blood that was shed on the cross of Calvary, because of the body that hung there in shame, you and I can be passed over that spiritual death and we can have eternal life with Him. Remember this day. Remember what I did for you. And celebrate this day. Celebrate what I did for you. There are some restrictions. The Lord's Supper is, is only for believers. If you're not a believer, why would you want to take it? If you do not believe in, in what He did and, and the sacrifice that He made and are not obedient to Him, why would you even want to take part? The Passover the Lord's Supper, forever entwined, great lessons for all. But what does this mean? What does this mean as we think about 2018? As we read what takes place in Exodus chapter 12, and we come forward to Luke and, and Matthew and Mark's accounts as well, and, and we have Jesus in the context here of this Passover, reminding them about the new covenant, reminding them to remember Him, reminding them to celebrate and to honor Him. 
What does this sacrifice mean for us? Well, it means redemption. Ephesians 1, 7, In Him we have redemption through His blood, the forgiveness of sins, in accordance with the riches of His grace. Colossians 1, 14, In whom we have redemption, the forgiveness of sins. Again, 1 Peter 1, 18 and 19, It's not with perishable things such as silver or gold that we are redeemed from the empty way of life handed down to you from your forefathers, but with the precious blood of Christ, a lamb without blemish or defect. A shepherd notches the ear of a lamb born to his flock and identifies him as his lamb and gives him rightful ownership. That lamb deliberately walks away and the shepherd searches near and far to get that lamb back. A long time later, he finds not a baby lamb, but a grown sheep for sale at an animal auction. The shepherd immediately recognizes his mark on that sheep's ear. And so he goes to the auctioneer and he says, look, I can see the mark. That sheep is mine. But the auctioneer says, no, you've got to bid and you've got to pay like everybody else. So the shepherd bids and he pays an outrageous price far above any reasonable market value in order to get his lamb. He now has a double right to own this sheep. First from birth, and second from redemption. God has a right to own us as creator, but also because he redeemed us in paying the blood of his own son, an outrageous price, and far, be, far above our market value in order to redeem us back again. What this means for us, redemption. Secondly, it means reconciliation. Romans 5, 10, if when we were God's enemies, we were reconciled to him through the death of his son, how much more being reconciled shall we be saved by his life? 2 Corinthians 5, 18, all this is from God who reconciled us to himself through Christ and gave us the ministry of reconciliation. Redemption. Reconciliation. It is a new covenant. Matthew 26, 28, Jesus says, this is the blood of the covenant which is poured out for many for the forgiveness of sins. And finally, it is justification. Romans 5, 9, Since we have now been justified by His blood, how much more shall we be saved from God's wrath through Him? Ephesians 2, 13, But now in Christ Jesus, you who once were far away have been brought near by the blood of Christ. A fellow by the name of Jeffrey Elbert tells this story. He says, when I was five years old, before factory installed seat belts and automobile airbags, my family was driving home at night on a two-lane country road. I was sitting on my mother's lap when another car, driven by a drunk driver, swerved into our lane and hit us head on. I don't have any memory of the collision. I do recall the fear and confusion I felt as I saw myself literally covered with blood from head to toe. Then I learned that the blood wasn't mine at all, but it was my mother's. In that split second, when the two headlights glared into her lane, she instinctively pulled me closer to her chest, curled her body around mine. It was her body that slammed against the dashboard, her head that shattered the windshield. She took the impact of the collision so that I wouldn't have to. It took extensive surgery for my mother to recover from her injuries. In a similar but infinitely more significant way, Jesus Christ took the impact for our sin. And his blood now permanently covers our lives from head to toe. May we never forget the importance of the Lord's Supper and the sacrifice that Jesus made for us. The reminder that just as God has the power to free His people from Egyptian slavery, so He has the power to free us from spiritual slavery. As we go through this year and focus specifically on abounding in the work of the Lord, may we do so 
with the sacrifice of Jesus in mind. Most of us need motivation to follow someone or something. We want reasons. Why should I do that? Why should I abandon the work of the Lord instead of something else? Why should I choose Jesus instead of someone else? Why should I decide I'm going to be a Christian instead of something else? For the very fact that no other person was willing to shed his blood on the cross to give you life. A great sacrifice because of a great love. That should give a great response. So tonight as we sing this song of encouragement, ask yourself what you're doing about the Passover lamb. The lamb that was shed on the cross for you. The lamb that was given so that death might pass over you. Have you done anything about it? Will you accept the gift that was given? Now, we're not told, at least I don't think we're told, I can go back and check more carefully, if all of the Jews obeyed, we kind of assume they did, why wouldn't you? But you know what would have happened if they had not obeyed? The firstborn would have been killed just like the Egyptians. God has made it pretty plain what he expects of us for the gift. To believe, to repent, to confess, to be baptized. To live faithfully and obedient before him. To say no to Satan, to say no to the world and live a life of, of Christianity. So tonight we want to encourage you to do that. And if we can help you in any way, please come as we stand and as we sing. Oh, do not let the word depart. And hold thine eyes against the Just a couple of announcements this evening to add to our bulletin. Those to add to our prayer list, we need to remember George Darst, who is dealing from ALS, whose health is deteriorating. Also to Robbie Michael, his cancer has grown and is inoperable. You remember, uh, please add both of those to your prayer list. Also the family of Donna Durham, who recently passed away. I have one card. Thank you for all the kindness and support you have given me and thank the ladies for the delicious meal, the Hansel Berryman family. If you did not have the opportunity to take the Lord's Supper, it has been left prepared in a little chapel to my back, to the right, to, to my left. Uh, someone will serve you at this time.
Please bow with me. Heavenly Father, Almighty God, we're so thankful to you for this day and this time that we've had to come to worship you, to learn more about your word, to study your word together, God. As that you would help us to remember the things we've learned here today. Take it with us as we go our separate ways. As that you would give us all the, the remembrance and the, and the strength and the willpower to study your word throughout this week, God. And so that we can be prepared for the next time we come together. We ask all these things in Christ's name. Amen.